Okay, good morning everybody. I guess we had better start. Yeah. So today and next Wednesday we're going to have two lectures on viruses and bacteriophage. And I put this slide up first because uh, naturally we have a tendency just to, to, to think about you know animal viruses. If you're thinking about human virology, uh, thinking viruses that uh, cause disease. And it's easy to forget that uh, viruses infect any kind of cell. So wherever you've got plants, insects, uh, bacteria, there will always be viruses that are parasites on cellular life. Now in the these two lectures, we're going to talk a little bit about bacteriophage and a little bit about a couple of human viruses. And that will be it, and maybe one or two words about tobacco mosaic virus. So what or how, how am I going to structure these next two lectures? So um, today is going to be the introduction, just to make sure everybody knows what viruses are, what are the differences between viruses <coughs> and bacteria. How do you study viruses? How do we get information about these biological objects? Then basics on virus structure and the virus replication cycle. And next week, have a look a little bit in a little bit more detail about lytic and lysogenic replication cycles. And we'll have a look at oh, a couple of infections. No, don't do. for smallpox, smallpox virus. We're not going to be looking at, say, a Ebola virus this year. Uh, because it was a huge epidemic uh, two years ago. Uh, now it's kind of uh, it's disappeared again. Uh, so I'm going to go back to smallpox as a, an example of a Highly, path highly pathogenic, highly transmissible virus that had a big impact on human health over centuries. So, if you know, what I try and do with this is to uh, pick out one virus that's been in the news a lot. And this year, I don't know if there's really been a big new virus. In it. Okay, so what is a virus? So if you go back about 100 years, then the definition of a virus would be uh, a filterable, transmissible agent. That is something that can cause an infectious disease, some kind of pathology. And it's filterable. That means that the size of the infectious particle is so small that it can pass through a filter that can retain all bacterial cells. So this was the functional definition of a virus going back 100 years ago. So it tells you something about what? Its biological properties. It can infect an organism and, and could cause something to happen. And the size of the particle, that's about it. However, it doesn't tell you much about what viruses are like, really. So um, <coughs> this was one of the reasons why... Yeah, since, since this is the ABT group, I'll talk about this in a bit more detail. So th this was the, the functional definition of viruses um, the beginning of the 20th century. And for the next couple of decades, that, that was it. That was a distinction between viruses and bacteria. And there were other things like uh, viruses don't grow in a culture medium. Uh, they are obligate intracellular parasites. However, there are some types of bacteria like uh, Chlamydia and Rickettsia, where uh, they're also, they also need a, only grow on host cells. And uh, in some cases, the infectious particles for Chlamydia is very, very small. So there was some kind of, um, th these kind of uh, limit cases of uh, the, the smallest, most parasitic bacteria and, and viruses. Uh, 
then there was, you know, the definition wasn't really clear enough. So uh, observations accumulated in the 1930s, 1940s about, uh, you know, small parasitic bacteria. Are they bacteria? Are they really, are they viruses? And so to try and clarify the situation a little bit, on Heide Wolf in uh, the Pasteur Institute proposed uh, this definition of viruses, or rather a kind of list of, of characteristics of what makes up a virus. And he tried to put together everything, you know, that was known about the biochemistry and the molecular biology of viruses at the time. So with his definition, he started out with carried on with size. So this is going back to the idea that they're filterable. The infectious particle is small. So for the Wolf, a virus is small with a diameter less than 250 nanometers. They are obligatory intracellular parasites. This is the type of lifestyle viruses have. And they are obligatory intracellular parasites because they do not carry the enzymes for energy metabolism or protein synthesis. They depend on the host cell for uh, these functions. What, now, the next thing that Lvov put into the definition was an observation about virus particles that really set them apart from cells. So at that time, all known viruses, when they were purified, were found to contain either RNA or DNA, but not both. Another observation that had become clear is that viruses don't replicate by binary division. So that distinct, clearly distinguishes viruses from cells. And another thing that one can add, but was, is not part of the Lvov definition, is that no virus carries a gene that codes for uh, ribosomal RNA. Now, this is really quite a surprising observation because our RNA is one of the most conserved molecules in the whole of um, all cellular life, and it's what has been we can use to uh, construct a universal phylogenetic tree. So viruses, and this seems to be a fundamental distinction between viruses and cells, and so much so that uh, there's a microbiologist in, at Pasteur called uh, Patrick Forter, and uh, he says that the whole of the history of life on planet Earth, you can look at it as a kind of three, three and a half billion year conflict between nucleic acid replicators that have ribosomes, and they make proteins, and those are cells, and the parasites, the replicators that don't have ribosomes, and these are viruses. And the history of life has been a kind of co-evolution between these two different types of nucleic acid replicators. So this is really a fundamental distinction between viruses and cells, no ribosomes. Now I'm going to have a little look at each of these uh, items in the Lvov definition and try and point out which of them are true in all cases and where there are some exceptions. Okay. So firstly, size. Virus particles are less than 250 nanometers in diameter. Well, that's true for the vast majority of viruses. So my, most viruses will be somewhere between 20 nanometers in diameter to about 150 nanometers in diameter. Now, at, uh, when, when Lvov uh, proposed his definition, the biggest virus that was known were pox viruses. That's one illustrated here. So the bar here shows is represents 200 nanometers. So you can see the diameter is just under 250 nanometers. And maybe the length is about 300 nanometers. So this was the largest known virus at the time, and it just came in under the under the bar. Since then, giant viruses have been discovered, called like Mimi virus, Pandora virus, and the particle is uh, up to uh, a micron in diameter. They can be seen in the light microscope. So there are some viruses which uh, break this rule. Okay, so at the extreme end of the size of virus particles, some huge viruses are bigger than this, uh, this limit. 
And in the other direction, it's also true because you have some bacterial cells which are very, very small. And notably, the mycoplasma. This is a mycoplasma here. Here, this, the scale bar is 100 nanometers. So you can see that the diameter of this cell is uh, only about 150 nanometers, a little bit longer. And just by electron microscopy, there's nothing really to say that uh, this biological object is any more complicated than this one. However, this uh, cell here, this, this, this object is a bacterial cell. And it can grow in a culture medium. If you give it the right uh, kind of food, it can grow and divide, and it will not require a host cell. So there's some kind of overlap between the smallest bacterial cells and the biggest virus particles. So this is a good description of most viruses, but doesn't clearly distinguish all bacteria from all viruses. Obligatory intracellular parasites. So as I was saying, this was part of the you know, original definition going back 100 years ago. But of course, uh, some bacteria also require host cells to, to grow. So mycobacterium leprae causes leprosy. Here's the host cell. Here are the intracellular bacteria on the electron microscopy here. Chlamydia. OK, here's the elementary body. This is the infectious particle, very, very small. And rickettsia, also uh, obligatory intracellular parasites. So this uh, mode of uh, reproduction is not restricted to viruses. <coughs> no enzymes for energy metabolism or protein synthesis. So most intracellular bacteria generate their own ATP. Except for chlamydia, which uh, have a kind of ATP, ADP transporter. So the bacterial cell, the chlamydial cell inside the host, will export ADP and import ATP. They don't generate their own ATP. They require the host cell to do that. However, for viruses, they all depend on the host to uh, produce metabolic energy and all their proteins. Over, over all bacteria produce their own proteins. That's for sure. Uh, ATP, ADP transporter. Does that remind you of anything in cell biology? Uh, mitochondria, right? So this is kind of consistent with the endosymbiotic theory. So there are some parasitic, some intracellular bacteria that are pathogens that have, you know, use the same kind of uh, system. But it's the other way around, though, isn't it? Because mitochondria, they're producing the ATP. Here, this, this guy is uh, sucking it all up. Okay. <coughs> Only one type of nucleic acid in viral virus particles. This was a fundamental difference between viruses and cells, because in every cell, the genomes in DNA, and all cells contain rRNA, tRNA, and messenger RNA, types of RNA required to produce proteins. When you purify and isolate virus particles and extract the nucleic acids, you can see that some have double-stranded DNA genomes, some have single-stranded DNA genomes. And you also find double and single-stranded RNA genomes in viruses. So more diversity in the type of genetic material. And the virus particle doesn't contain any of these other nucleic acids involved in gene expression. True at the time the Wolf wrote his definition in 1957. So since then, some viruses, some large DNA viruses are found that contain messenger RNAs inside the particle. I'll just kind of draw this one for you. So herpes viruses, large envelope DNA viruses with an icosahedral capsid. 
they contain some messenger RNA in between the capsid and the envelope. So when this virus infects a host cell, one of the first things that happens is that these messenger RNAs can get into the host cell cytoplasm and start being expressed before any of the DNA arrives in the nucleus. Yes? And what's the aim of the messenger RNA in the heart to allow for the fibrillation? So this allows the virus to start expressing its genes very, very quickly because this is a double-stranded DNA virus. All of this has got to get transported to the nucleus and then the host cell RNA polymerase has got to start transcribing viral genes. So it takes time. So this allows the virus to start expressing genes immediately. Yeah, and um, sorry, um, what kind of genes would they transport? Oh, uh, things that will uh, inhibit the host cell response to virus infection. Oh. This kind of stuff. So uh, there are also some proteins inside uh, this part of the virus particle, which would be transported into the cytosol and also start to uh, undermine host cell function. So there are some, okay, so this is a generally true for most viruses, but there are some exceptions, especially in the very large DNA viruses. <coughs> okay, so that's the definition of viruses. I'll, I'll leave off on the binary division till a bit later on. Oh, I, should, I should leave that maybe. Uh, how, how do you study viruses? There are two big problems really. So one is that they are too small for direct visualization, so you can't see them under the light microscope. And the second is that they only replicate inside other living organisms. You can't isolate them on a Petri dish or grow them up in a culture medium. You can't grow them in pure culture, which is what you would do with bacteria. And so there's two kind of approaches. One of them is to try and study the virus particle in isolation. What, it, what is it made of? What is it like? So the idea is first is you're going to grow up the virus in some kind of a production system and purify the virus particles and then analyze it with a variety of physical chemical techniques. So that will tell you what, the, what is in the virus particle, what its structure is. So when I say something like this, particles contain only one type of nucleic acid. That's this kind of experiment. The second kind of approach, oh, why does it do this? Second type of approach is to try and understand how viruses replicate, how they undermine the host. And then what you'll do is you'll get some of the viruses that you've purified from this kind of approach here, infect a cell or an organism, and then what you want to do is find out what gene, what virus genes are expressed, where, where, which virus proteins are expressed, where, this kind of thing. So you'll follow the expression of virus proteins by immunochemistry, and you'll have followed the expression of virus genes by molecular biology. So the design of this kind of experiment would be, for example, in cell culture, you've got a bunch of cells. You add the virus in, and then you'll take samples at different time points, three hours, six hours, 12 hours, this kind of thing. Now in this virus, you might have sequenced the genome. So you'll know that I've got maybe four different genes here. Call them A, B, C, and D. Then you sample your cells at different time points. You might find out that only gene C is expressed at this time point. Then later on, you might get 
C and D, and then you might get A, B, C, and D. And then you'll get an idea. Okay, so this is an early gene. This is expressed early after infection. A and B, these are late genes. When you look at the cells that were infected, have a look at their morphology, and you give you an idea of uh, what these genes are doing. You might also quantify the number of copies of viral genome copies that you have in these cells. So over the same time period, you could get a little a graph of, uh, so this is your virus DNA, early time points, not doing anything, then you get replication, then it stops. And then you might see that, okay, I need the expression of gene C in order to get DNA replication. So little by little, you build up a picture of when these genes are expressed in the cell and what they're doing at different time points in the virus replication cycle. So, so that's what I mean by this general approach here, okay? Production systems. Well, originally, these were whole organisms. So for Pasteur's work with the rabies virus, he was able to propagate the virus by taking the brains of an infected animal and inoculating it directly into the brain of another animal. And he was able to <coughs> develop an attenuated strain of the virus uh, by this technique. The plant viruses also originally were, were uh, investigated in this kind of way. So you take a material that shows pathology from the leaves of the plant, grind it up, pass it through a filter, and use it to uh, infect the next plant. So these are still used uh, in some cases. For example, some viruses are very, very difficult to uh, propagate in cell culture. Uh, some uh, viruses used in veterinary medicine are still uh, prepared, uh, some vaccines rather, used for vet veterinary medicine are, are prepared by infecting the whole animal the animal gets sick, it dies. You take, up it, take the liver, grind it up, inactivate it with formal, and that's your vaccine. Okay? So uh, whole, whole, whole organism production met methods are still used in some exceptional cases. Also, you could, you, you could think of embryonic, embryonated eggs as a whole organism technique for producing viruses. So uh, influenza vaccines are produced by inoculating embryonated eggs with viruses. So it's still used for, 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 for in, some, in some applications. However, most of what we know about the details of virus replication come from cell culture systems. Now, the, of course, these were available first for bacteriophage, that is viruses that infect bacteria. And were developed in the 1940s for eukaryotic viruses. So this was the uh, uh, isolation of the first immortalized human cell line. Anybody know which what that one was? HeLa cells, isolated from a woman with a very aggressive uh, um, uh, uh, cervical cancer. Uh, so this was the first immortalized human cell line. This allowed you to grow viruses. Okay, before that, primary cells were used from uh, monkey kidneys, this kind of stuff. It's possible to culture viruses, but a little less uh, uh, reproducible and, and trickier. So once you've got cell culture that works very well for human cell lines, then you can start to study human viruses. So there you've got your production system. Whatever it is, you add in your infectious material, or your virus, it will replicate within the host. And at the end, you'll have a whole mixture of uh, viruses and dead host cells. And what you want to do is purify the virus from that. And the big classical technique is density gradient ultracentrifugation. So you start out with your crude lysate, which will contain soluble proteins, big lumps of uh, cell debris, 
and some virus particles. So you layer the whole of this on a gradient of sucrose, cesium chloride. So it's going to be very dense down here and up to 1.0 gram per ml at the top of the gradient. You put this in the ultracentrifuge, 200,000 G for 12 hours. So all these different components will sediment out through the gradient. So the cell debris is going to end up in the bottom. The soluble proteins will remain here or just go into the top of the gradient. And the virus particles will accumulate where the density of the particle is equal to the density of the medium in the gradient. And so if you do that, you get this kind of result here. So this is, a, if, you, if you've got a lot of viruses, then you can actually see the, the band here in the gradient. So <coughs> debris here, soluble proteins up there, virus particles here. You harvest the band and you can check that you've got pure virus particles by electron microscopy, so you don't have any other objects here, which is quite homogeneous. You've just got virus particles. Here again, it's pox viruses. And then you can use whatever physical chemical technique you want to analyze uh, what is in these particles. And in here you can see by uh, STS page that there are, oh no, maybe a dozen, couple of dozen different proteins in these particles. This is quite unusual. Again, we've got big complex a big complex virus here. It's got a lot of different proteins in the particle. Most viruses will have between one and 10 proteins in the, in the particle. And that's how we know. OK, so that's the <coughs> basic methodology. Okay, basics of virus structure. Okay, so virus particles or the virion are either non-enveloped or naked. So they're composed of a nucleic acid in the middle and a protein capsid on the outside. Or enveloped, in which case you've got the nuclear capsid in the middle and a lipid membrane on the outside, which is called the envelope. Now among naked virus particles. There are two types of, uh, well, architecture. You either have rod-shaped particles, which are of helical symmetry, or round spherical particles, which have icosahedral symmetry. Yeah, icosahedral because they're like in French. And bacteriophage have a kind of mix, many bacteriophage have a mix of these two elements. For envelope viruses, okay, simple envelope viruses, you've got either a helical capsid with an envelope or an icosahedral capsid with an envelope. And then complex particles are envelope particles where the structure on the inside of the particle is not really clear. It doesn't really correspond to either of these two models. So just for helical and icosahedral capsids, how are they well, how are they made up? Well the basic function of the capsid is to protect the nucleic acid genome. Right. Uh, RNA, DNA, or well, DNA is relatively stable, but RNA is not a st stable molecule chemically or uh, enzymatically. So when a virus infects your body, if it starts to just release DNA or RNA into your bloodstream, this will not last very long because you have uh, nucleases in your extracellular fluid. So the basic uh, function of the capsid is to protect the genome of the virus from uh, chemical and enzymatic attack. And the kind of concept behind helical capsid uh, architecture is, you know, we've got a, a long linear polymer. This is uh, the nucleic acid, DNA or RNA. It's a linear polymer. So what can be done to protect this nucleic acid is just to cover it 
in a helix of protein. So if I've got protein subunits that form a kind of a round structure or a helical structure, they can wrap around the nucleic acid. And you keep on adding protein subunits until you come to the end of the nucleic acid. And that's it. Job's done. You've covered the whole of the genome with protein. So it will be protected. So that's basically uh, how a lot of uh, plant virus uh, helical non-envelope virus capsids are formed. They have several thousand copies of one capsid protein. that uh, forms a helix around the uh, nucleic acid. Now, there's a problem with this, which is if in your kind of viral state you want to become more complicated and uh, accumulate new functions, then you'll have to add new genes to the genome. So the nucleic acid will become longer. And that means the particle is going to become longer and longer. And that's going to end up becoming a physical problem. So here you've got a particle of tobacco mosaic virus. The genome is about five kilobases, five and a half kilobases in length. And already you've got a particle. This is about 10 nanometers diameter here. And it's probably a couple of hundred nanometers long. If you start elongate, if you start make, building a particle that's even longer, it's going to start to become physically less stable and can even, you know, snap in half. It's difficult to imagine, but, it, you know, if you're talking about breaking a molecule in half, but it can happen. So the physical uh, stability <coughs> of this kind of particle places a limit on the genome size of the viruses that have this kind of uh, morphology. And the solution to this problem it, uh, was cracked by uh, capsids with icosahedral symmetry. So here the idea is, okay, we forget about thinking about the DNA or RNA molecule as a long, stretched out uh, linear molecule. Of course, this can be uh, wound up into a ball and compacted in three dimensions. You don't have to put it out in two dimensions. So. The basic idea between, behind icosahedral capsids is that the capsid proteins are going to form uh, a hollow sphere, and the nucleic acid is going to be in the middle. So <coughs> the simplest way to do this is with uh, uh, 60 copies of the same protein. And in that case, you can visualize the capsid as you know, three copies of the protein will make a triangular face, and 20 of these triangular faces make up an icosahedron. So that's the uh, reason why these are called capsids with icosahedral symmetry. Now, with this simple system, 60 copies of the same protein, you can only make pretty small capsids. However, if you add a few more proteins, then you can make icosahedral capsids that are bigger and bigger. And you can pack more and more DNA or RNA inside these capsids. Okay, simple envelope viruses. So simple envelope viruses. In the middle, you've got the nucleic acid and the capsid. On the outside, you have the envelope, and then often you have some kind of proteins in between. So, <coughs> in the, for all of these viruses, you're going to have to have envelope glycoproteins. Why? Because with a naked virus, the interaction of the virus and the with the host cell, especially the receptor. It's going to occur between the capsid proteins and the receptor on the host cell. So this is going to mediate the, inter the, the binding and entry of the virus into the host. Once you've got an envelope virus, 
the capsid proteins aren't open to the outside of the virus particle anymore, so they can't perform this function. So all envelope viruses must have an envelope glycoprotein, and its function is going to be interacting with the receptor on the host cell. So all envelope viruses have got something like this. And in many cases, but not all, you'll have uh, proteins in between the nucleocapsid and the envelope. So for rhabdoviruses, these are called a matrix proteins. For herpes viruses, they're called a tegument proteins. So the matrix proteins, their function is often just to maintain the physical integrity of the particle. It's kind of like glue fixing the nucleocapsid to the envelope. They're also involved in... Uh, formation of these particles as they bud from the host cell membranes. And in herpes viruses, the tegument proteins, as I said, they are released into the host cell cytosol very early after infection. Not really a, a structural role here. Okay, so that's it for the, the, the virology basics. Okay, the viruses are filterable infectious agents. How do you study viruses and the basic elements of a virus structure? Uh, so just think about these questions for a couple of minutes, and then we'll see. So one to three should be pretty obvious, four or five, maybe not. Okay, everybody ready? So one, correct, who says true? Who says false? Yeah, it's true, right, I just said it, so two. Who says true? Who says false? Yeah, it's right, okay. Just don't get mixed up between capsid, capsule, okay? In bacteria have the capsule, viruses have a capsid. They sound similar, but they're different things. Main function of the capsid is to predate the virus genome. True, right? Yeah, okay. So four, naked viruses more resistant to detergents than envelope viruses. Who says true? Who says false? Who says we can't know? Uh, you can know by applying your basic knowledge of biochemistry. Um, somebody here who says false, why? So if you say this is not true, you mean what? It's uh, equally resistant or Envelope viruses are more resistant. So, why? Okay, so they've got an extra layer, so they should be more resistant. Okay, kind of like a bacterial endospore, it's got lots of layers, so it should be more chemically resistant. Somebody who says this is true, why is this true? <laughs> yeah, that's the answer is this is correct because the envelope is a lipid membrane. Lipids are sensitive to detergents and solvents. 
structure. In fact, it's not a very resistant structure. It's, uh, uh, you know, you can destroy it with soap, whereas a uh, protein capsid is quite resistant. But this has practical applications in what kind of uh, uh, dis disinfection uh, procedures you will need for different viruses. So, for example, for influenza virus, it's an envelope virus, simple hand washing can be an effective uh, means of uh, preventing transmission. Because people who are infected might cough and sneeze, <coughs> they get virus on their hands and then can transmit it to someone else. Uh, whereas for uh, noroviruses, which, call, which are small non-envelope viruses that cause gastroenteritis, they're pretty tough. You know, you need quite uh, strong chemical condition, uh, conditions to inactivate the virus. Okay, so four is correct. Five, viruses are not living organisms. Who agrees with this statement? Who says, yes, they're alive, they're just like you and me? No, but who, who doesn't care whether they're alive or not? Most people, right? Um. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, it, you have something like <coughs> Mycobacterium leprae. If it's a bacterial cell, it cannot grow outside of a host cell. There have been a lot of efforts to uh, culture this uh, bacterium in a defined culture medium, but it still doesn't, it still doesn't work. Uh, chlamydia is also, also true. I mean, they, they require a, a host cell. So these bacteria uh, cannot live independently, okay? Even in an artificial situation where we create the culture conditions that, that, they, that they might like. However, we would still consider these bacteria to be living, right? Whereas viruses, probably most people might say no, or at least you would understand that the, the, the question is not so clear as that, okay? So it's kind of a, uh, for me anyway, I think it's an interesting ph philosophical question because there, it means that it's very difficult to draw a clear dividing line. Also, you have some bacteriophages which can uh, switch between being carried as a plasmid or as an element inside the bacterial chromosome or DNA and a free living virus. So you have a kind of continuum between mobile DNA elements and viruses. Um, so if you say viruses are living, right, if, you, if you decide that, then uh, you, have to, you, you have to kind of accept that in some sense plasmid would be a living organism as well. But that seems like it's going too far. Whereas if you say no, viruses are not living, then what do you mean by life? I suppose you mean something that's got ribosomes then. That means that's what the, the definition of life is. And that means replication is not really the uh, sufficient as a definition of living. Okay, well, I see that uh, it's not uh, setting anybody's uh, neurons on fire here, so we'll just uh, plow on until uh, 9.20, and then we can all go and do something else. Okay, absence of binary division. This was one of the... Uh, criteria in uh, Lavos' definition of viruses. And this is definitely true for all viruses. Now, what does this mean? Okay, so when all cellular organisms divide, you start with a cell, it grows, gets bigger, and then at some point, either by fission or by budding, you end up with two daughter cells. But at all stages of this process, process you've got a clearly defined cell, right? Now, you might imagine that the same thing happens with viruses, that when viruses replicate, you'll start off with a single particle, the particle will grow bigger, 
And then finally, you know, it's going to separate into two independent virus particles. This does not happen at all. No virus replicates like this. And the reason we know that comes from very simple experiments that were started in the 1930s. So before we get to the punchline here, I'm going to explain a little bit about this uh, great classical experiment in uh, virology from 1939, Max Delbrück and Ellis, where what they were trying to do was just sketch out the uh, <coughs> Uh, growth curve of bacteriophages. Okay, so in bacteriology, you've got the growth curve of bacteria, uh, the kind of um, incubation phase, exponential growth, and then a plateau phase. So they're trying to do the same kind of thing for viruses. So the idea is you get your bacteriophage, and instead of inoculating it into culture medium, you have to inoculate it into something that viruses like to eat, that is culture of host cells. So you infect the bacterial culture, then take it at samples at different times, and then measure the number of phase that you have at different time points. And these are the results, some of the results from the first from that paper. So this, this, is, this is time, and these are the number of plaque forming units per ml or on a log scale. So you get this kind of single step growth curve for bacteriophage, a, uh, an incubation phase or very fast release phase, and then a plateau. So to understand the interpretation of this, you have to understand a little bit how the plaque assay works. So from each of these samples that were taken from the infected bacterial culture, they start off by preparing a series of dilutions, so 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000 to a million fold. And then they mix up 0.1 ml of this sample with a fixed amount of bacteria and maybe 10 ml of soft agar. Pour that onto the top of the plate, culture it overnight, and what you get is this. So when you've got a very, very diluted sample, there are no bacteriophage around, so the bacteria that you've also inoculated will grow all over the plate, and you get a... Uh, uh, a kind of uniform lawn of bacteria all over the place. When you have a very high concentration of phage, all the bacteria that are inoculated get infected. They're all killed. They're all lies. So you get a, your plate is entirely clear. And then at some point, what you have is a plate which has bacteria most all, mostly all over the plate, but with clear plaques which show the presence of one phage or one infected cell in the original sample. So to count the number of bacteriophage that you had in the original sample, you count the number of plaques, multiply by the dilution factor, and then by another factor of 10 because you, got, you inoculated 0.1 ml. So you can say in this sample we had 8.3 times 10 to the 5 plaque forming units per ml. Okay. So in this experiment, <coughs> one plaque represents what? One of these three things. Okay, has everybody made their minds up? Okay, who says one? One, you've got plaque, it's an infectious phage, but non-infected bacteria. 
nobody says that. Two, one infectious phage, three in the culture medium or inside an infected bacterium. One person. Three, one infectious phage or one infected bacterium, no matter how many phage are inside it. Who says that? One person, no, two people, three, maybe four. Most people not really not really saying anything. All right, so to illustrate what I mean by this question, right, if you've got this situation here, how many plaques would that give you? One, right? If you've got this situation, how many plaques? Four, correct. Okay, that's absolutely right. Good. Okay, everybody understand that? Yes. Because when this is inoculated, okay, it's in one single cell, it will release these phage, but they're all going to stay localized. <coughs> you just get one plaque. Okay, good. Okay, so now we could, now you understand, hopefully everybody understands this. So what's the interpretation of the result here? Okay. So here's the, uh, the basic re result from the Ellison-Delbrick experiments. You've got the latent phase, release phase, and a kind of plateau phase, a one step uh, growth curve. So what you might imagine is happening is that shortly after infection, your phage enters the bacterium. It will replicate inside <coughs> the host cell. So you go from one phage inside the host to multiple phages. But these are still inside the infected cell, right? So you still only get one plaque. So that's why the curve stays flat here. All right? And then you get this cell is going to explode, it's going to, all, and all these phages are going to be released. So you get a very, very rapid exponential release over maybe five minutes. And then once these guys are released, there's no more host cells around, so they, you just have a stable number. <coughs> now that's the, that's the model, and one would like to test the model. So what was then done is that what you can do is lice these bacterial cells because these are gram-negative bacteria, Escherichia coli, sensitive to chloroform, whereas this is a naked, non-enveloped virus particle resistant. So you can lice the infected cells, and that gives you access to, the, to be able to count the number of phage inside the infected bacteria. So if you do that, then you get this kind of result. Okay, so the dotted line is what we had before. And the solid line is if you perform the experiment by uh, lysing the bacteria with chloroform, and then you count only the infectious phage. And the big surprise here is that at early time points after infection, you've got like nothing. You don't detect any phage inside the infected bacteria. So this is called the eclipse phase. And what that means is that just after the infection, in the infection there's no bacteria phage present. You've got an infected cell, but it doesn't contain any infectious phage on the inside. Then later on, when you start to see plaques reappear here, that's when you've got, here you've got a lot of bacteria phage inside the cell, but they haven't been released yet. And then they'll be released. <coughs> so that means during the eclipse phase, at some point, your bacteria phage particle doesn't exist anymore. And you can visualize this by electron microscopy. If you infect a, a culture and then take pictures at uh, uh, different time points, then you can try and see what is happening. So this is uh, with a chlorella virus. So it uh, infects a chlorella uh, eukaryotic single-celled uh, algae. So the first events are attachment onto the surface of the host cell, uh, degradation of the cell wall, and then entry. And in this case, as with bacteriophage, what enters the host cell is not the whole virus particle, but just the genome. So you can see visually that you've got the capsid on the outside, but the genome on the inside. So that's why you don't have any infectious virus anymore, because an infectious virus is capsid plus nucleic acid. So here, you have separated these two components. So once this occurs, then you're in the eclipse phase. And then you've just got the infected cell. Then later on in this system, you can see that a few hours later, you begin to have 
virus particles that assemble and accumulate inside the host, and then they will be released here by lysis. So little by little, you begin to uh, describe the different steps in the virus replication cycle, which are true for every virus, true for bacteriophage, true for eukaryotic viruses, and they're also true even for these giant viruses that have very, very large genomes and uh, very large particles. So the first step is attachment. Sitting on the outside of the host cell is no good. All viruses have got to enter into the host cell. Then at some point, the virus particle has got to release the viral genome. So either this happens at the same time as entry or in a separate step. So this is called decapsidation. So once decapsidation occurs, then you're in the eclipse phase. Okay. First starts, first stages, then you're in the eclipse phase of replication here. Decapsidation, you release the virus genome. What has to happen is you've got to get lots of copies of the genome, express viral proteins, and then once you have that, then new virus particles can be assembled, which will have to be released. So every virus has got to accomplish all of these steps in order to replicate efficiently. So that's what is meant by viruses don't replicate by, uh, by, uh, by binary cell division. At some point in their replication cycle, they've got to be disassembled and then reconstructed apart from their component parts, like a kind of like Lego model or something that's made up inside the cell. So it's very, very different from the way cells divide. Okay? It's more like the way some macromolecular assemblage inside the cell is, like the way a ribosome is going to be produced. OK, so uh, uh, I'll tell you the way I try and visualize this on a human scale. Right? So it's as if I were to go and get in my car and go and drive to the, to the shipyard in San Nazaire. So I, I, I'm the genome, right? And the car is my capsid. So I drive up to the gates on San Nazaire and in the shipyard, and I somehow manage to convince the guys on the, on the security on the gates that, yeah, let me in, let me in. So they let me in. And I get up to the head offices, and I get out of my car. And I go in there, and I manage to uh, change the industrial procedures in the factory, stop them from making ships, and get them all to try and make new car components. And I convert all of the workforce in the whole factory into copies of me. And then, once we've got a whole <coughs> bunch of new cars and a whole bunch of new Dorian McElroy's, we all like, get into the cars and drive off. And then blow up the ships uh, shipyard as we leave. Okay, so that's, that's the viral replication cycle on a human scale. And then we go all around like, the region everywhere and infect every other industrial site in the, in the, in the, in the country. Okay, so that, that's virus replication. And these are things really you have to remember about this, that the way viruses replicate is absolutely fundamentally different compared to the way cells divide. We know this beginning with simple experiments on bacteriophage and looking at the simple one-step growth curve. And every virus has got to uh, perform all of these steps. Uh, so that means if you think about antiviral drugs in human virology, what you want to do is block one of these steps. Then the virus won't be able to replicate and you'll have an effective therapy. So depending on the virus, I would say probably most drug classes will be acting on gene expression and genome replication. However, there are drugs that will prevent effective release, and there are uh, antiviral drugs that act on the early steps of, of entry. <coughs> oh, okay, 
bacteriophages and viral infections. Uh, that's good. Seem to be going a bit faster than I thought. Uh, what do we need to do here? Yeah, so I think we'll have time to look at the lytic bacteriophage replication cycle, okay? Um, or at least think about, well, maybe, maybe not. So bacteriophages, all right? So they're viruses infecting bacteria. And as I hope you realize, there are tons of bacteria all over the planet. And because there are a lot of bacteria, there's going to be a lot of bacteriophage. So how many bacteriophages are there on planet Earth? This is going to be the question. So let's start with one ml of seawater. Just you know, put your hands up, whatever you think is the right number here. One per ml, 100 per ml, 10,000 per ml, a million per ml, 100 million per ml. Oh, a few people, OK. Okay, the answer is depend, depends where you take your sample. Okay, so in a deep sea water out in the middle of the ocean, then you'll get about a million per ml. But in a coastal environment, which is much more productive, many more bacteria, yes, then you'll be talking more like 100 million per ml. So if you, you know, swimming in the beach and you swallow, uh, take the mouthful, you'll have hundreds of millions of bacteriophage. Okay, this is total number of marine viruses, by the way. But most of those will be viruses infecting bacteria. Um, so <clears throat> once you know that, you can try and figure out how many uh, bacteriophages there are in the whole of the world's oceans. <sighs> OK, right, so we're in powers of 10 of powers of 10 here, right? So 10 to the 10. And it'd be, you know, just. Raise your hand. Just give me some kind of feedback here, because it's a bit lonely up at the front all on my own, with no, with nobody saying anything. Ten to the twenty bacteriophage. Ten to the thirty. Ten to the forty. Whoa! Everybody wants a big number. Th this is way too high. Actually, I have no idea how, how how big this number is. I don't even know if there are that many atoms in planet Earth, right? Yeah, so once you start getting up to, I mean, these huge numbers here, it's very, very difficult to, to know how big that is. The real answer is 10 to the 30, okay? There's about 10 to the 30 bacteriophage in the whole of the world's oceans. So how, 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 how much is that? Okay, so uh, this is, actually, these numbers came from a, a, a Nature comment article by a marine biologist called Chris Suttle. So I kind of shamelessly lifted them from, from, from there. So <laughs> what he proposed in the article was that, OK, each virus will have about 0.2 femtograms of carbon. So how much carbon is that? He said, OK, you could take your calculator out and multiply uh, this by that, and you can calculate the number of kilograms. But he, his idea was that, yeah, this is the equivalent to how many blue whales, just to try and envisage the size of this stuff, OK? OK, so one blue whale, 100. Pretty big, right? 10,000. Uh, quite a few people. A million. A million blue whales. A hundred million. Actually, it's the equivalent of 75 million blue whales. Okay, that's the amount of carbon in, the, in all the marine bacteriophage. You know, it's, it's huge. And in terms of uh, length, you know, if you put them all end to end, how much, how long would this be? <coughs> OK. And apparently it works out to about 10 million light years, just as you put them all end to end. So there's a, there are a huge amount of, of, of these of marine bacteriophage. Now, <coughs> that means that uh, these marine viruses are something like the cold, dark matter of, uh, you know, the, the biosphere. In terms of quantity, they're the second largest amount of uh, organic carbon and organic nitrogen 
in, uh, in the biosphere. Okay? The first is prokaryotes, bacteria. The second is prokaryotic viruses. And because they're so, so huge, that means they play, these phage are playing a significant role in the carbon and the nitrogen cycle, which I'll just about have time to talk about. So if you think of you know, simple carbon cycle in uh, a marine environment, you'll have inorganic carbon being fixed by these bacteria, which we would call In terms of metabolic type, uh, trophic type, they are? Yes. So you have the autotrophs fixing carbon. And then these guys are going to be eaten by, I don't know, uh, uh, zooplankton. Microscopic uh, zooplankton. So, uh, I don't know, amoeba, something like this, they're going to graze on the cyanobacteria, for example, the most, uh, most of this will be cyanobacteria in the oceanic environment. So they're going to be eaten by something, right? And then these guys are going to be eaten by, I don't know, krill, uh, shrimps, this kind of stuff, eaten by fish, and then this will go up to, like, sharks. So you have carbon moving up the trophic levels here, okay? Primary producers to the... the uh, apex predators. So from time to time, these guys are going to die, and the organic carbon <coughs> is going to be metabolized by heterotrophic bacteria. We're going to be down in the ocean sediments degrading all this stuff. So this is your simple trophic web without bacteriophage. Now, if you've got bacteriophage involved here, what this means is that these bacteriophage are going to be infecting and lysing these autotrophs, and this will produce new phage, and it will also release dissolved organic carbon, which can be uh, used as a source by these heterotrophs. And the heterotrophs will also be infected and lysed by uh, bacteriophage. So the net result of this is that a lot of the carbon that is going to be fixed by these autotrophs is not going to be available for higher trophic levels. It's going to be shuttled around between autotrophs and heterotrophs. And these bacteriophages themselves, if they are not infectious for this type of bacterium. It's just floating organic carbon and organic nitrogen. It's just a kind of little packet of uh, protein. It's a DNA sandwich in a protein uh, with protein bread, right? So it can be eaten by other bacteria. So you've got these uh, bacteriophages. Are, are, it's a kind of the bacteriophage shunt, which keeps organic carbon and nitrogen shuttling around uh, between uh, in prokaryotes. So that's the impact of uh, phage lysis, bacteriophages on uh, marine ecosystems. Um, okay. One more, yeah, no, yeah, okay, nine minutes. I think this might be a good time to stop there. T since we're talking about the impact of phage on uh, bacterial populations, Another thing that seems to occur, uh, and there's only been, uh, there's, is for, for some bacterial populations that can infect humans, specific, particularly uh, cholera bacterium, okay, lives uh, freely in, in, uh, in open water and uh, can, can, can infect people. Uh, there's, a, there's at least some evidence to indicate that Lytic phage populations have a kind of like predator-prey uh, population cycle in, uh, in free water. So you'll have fluctuations in the bacterial population that are related to how many lytic bacteria phage there are. So uh, <coughs> you'll have 
this kind of curve over time. So this is your bacteria number, and this is the phage number here in, in red. So you'll have a population cycles in the bacteria that are really mirroring the number of lytic bacteriophages that are in the uh, that are in the same ecosystem. I don't know if this is has really been well established, but there are actually quite very few studies of virus population ecology with their natural bacterial reservoirs in a you know in a, in a natural system. So uh, this has been advanced for, for cholera bacteria, but it's been studied because it's important for uh, trying to figure out what the, 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 the epidemic risk is going to be. Um, but generally speaking, there's quite, there's not very much data on the influence of uh, virus populations on the dynamics of the host in, in bacteria, okay? So the idea is there's this kind of like equilibrium that holds up, but, you know, not very many studies have been done in, in natural environments. Okay, so I'll stop there and we will uh, come back next week, Wednesday morning, for more details of lytic and acidogenic phage replication cycles and a little bit about two human infections.